Chapter 154 The War Autumn 1978 Stop your messing around Better think of your future Time is straight right out Remus peered over the top of his book through the cafe window to see if there had been any changes in the street ahead of him. He looked at the clock on the greasy wall behind him. Five minutes to go, if Pete wasn't running late. Remus looked at his book again. He hadn't really been reading it, he was too distracted. He found himself rarely in the mood for studying these days. Between order meetings, strange and half-explained assignments, visiting Hope in the hospice, which he tried to do every other day now. On top of this, Remus and Sirius were learning to look after themselves for the first time. After a week of takeaways, Remus admitted defeat and asked to borrow a recipe book from Mrs Potter. Results had been mixed so far. Sirius, meanwhile, seemed to have reached crisis point at the state of the bathroom and dedicated several evenings to finally learning some cleaning spells. They'd had a fight, over whether or not to get a television. Sirius was bizarrely suspicious of this muggle technology. He couldn't see the point. And then another one over the motorbike. Remus hated everything about it, but most of all the highly dangerous flying charms Sirius was attempting. Other than that, things were going pretty well. Well, as well as anyone could expect. The clock kept ticking. Remus lifted the chipped mug of tea to his lips, drank, then grimaced. Stone cold. He'd been there at least an hour, but it wasn't as if he had anywhere else to be. Since the botched mission to Nocturne Alley back in July, Remus had noticed a clear shift in the nature of his missions. He was often paired with Peter, and generally only sent on soft assignments, passing on messages, collecting dead port keys. Once or twice he'd been stuck making sandwiches for visitors to the Potters. Meanwhile, Sirius and James's fortunes had taken them in a completely different direction. They both spent much of their time with Frank and Alice, or the Pruitt twins, up to all sorts of interesting things, like advanced defences, guard duties, and even one or two midnight raids. Sirius was having the time of his life. Remus was miserable, but not saying so. In other words, business as usual. Finally, Remus looked up and saw movement. It was the end of the working day, and men in smart suits and hats began to fill the pavements. If you looked very closely, you could see that some of these men and women were dressed a bit less conservatively than others. It was the end of the day at the Ministry of Magic, too. Remus got up quickly, banging his shins on the orange plastic chair beside him. Hissing through his teeth, he limped slightly on his way out. Outside was muggy, not sunny but hot and sticky, headache weather. Thick, queasy storm clouds hung above the grey buildings, and a powerful reek rose up from cafe bins, old food putrefying in the unseasonable September heat. Remus hung back a moment, watching and waiting, not wanting to be seen. A tall, handsome young man strode past, wearing black robes and a bottle-green waistcoat. He had sharp cheekbones and platinum hair. Though he was very young, Remus recognised him at once as Lucius Malfoy, the man Narcissa had risked her life to marry. Remus watched him stalk up the street, fleetingly commenting Sirius's cousin on her excellent taste. Oh, hello, Mooney. Remus jumped. Peter somehow still had the ability to take him by surprise. You almost never saw him coming. Christ, Pete, you scared me. Hm, well, if you hadn't been perving on Malfoy's arse, Shut up. Remus was already in a bad mood, and much too sensitive to be teased by Peter Pettigrew, of all people. Didn't expect to see you, Peter was saying, glancing at his pocket watch and tucking it back into his trouser pocket. He was wearing a tweed jacket and a stupid little bowler hat, mustard-coloured. He looked like an off-brand leprechaun. Remus scolded himself internally, ashamed of himself for being jealous of his friend who, despite only having scooped up a handful of newts, had managed to walk into an entry-level position in the ministry. No bother. What do you mean? 
Remus frowned. I'm on time, aren't I? D- didn't you get Arthur's message? Peter looked up at him innocently. Got cancelled. They sent Caradoc. Oh, Remus pursed his lips. So we can go home, Peter said cheerily. Thank Godric, I'm exhausted. Work was mayhem today. I'm rushed off my feet. Right, of course. Remus nodded, his shoulders slumping. He hadn't got out of bed until midday. Then all he'd done was read the papers and smoke and eat half a loaf of bread, which Sirius had bought only the morning before. This had been his longest conversation with another human being all day. Are you sure they don't need us? He said hopefully. Maybe if we went along anyway. Best not. Peter shook his head. You know what Moody's like about protocol. Anyway, I'm starving. I barely even had time for lunch. Really? Do you, do you want to go and get something at the leaky cauldron then? Ah, oh, sorry. Promised Mum I'd be home. She worries, you know. Oh, of course. Padfoot is at your flat, isn't he? Yeah, he should be back by now. I'll see you the next meeting, Mooney. Yeah, see you. They walked off in opposite directions, Peter heading for the nearest flue gate. He still hadn't learnt to apparate. Remus for the nearest quiet alley he could slink into and vanish in peace. He tried to cheer up a bit as he stood outside the door to his flat. He shook himself, attempted to clear his mind, forced a smile. He opened the door. You're back early! Cyrus's voice chimed from the kitchen. That was enough to throw Remus back into his dark mood. It felt like an accusation. Hmm, he grunted, shutting the door and pulling off his cardigan, the hairs on his arms itching and prickling in the heat. It made his scars raise too, like barbed wire. What's up? Cyrus appeared. He'd showered recently, his hair still gleamed. Something happened? Cyrus snorted, kicking his shoes off and flinging them under the coffee table. Nothing happened. It got cancelled. Or someone else did it. (sighs) Doesn't matter anyway. It was just busy work. No, it wasn't, Cyrus tutted. Why would Dumbledore give you busy work? Because I can't be trusted to do anything else. But they still want to keep me on side so I don't suddenly go evil. Mooney! Cyrus had his hands on his hips now. Remus sighed and waved a hand. (sighs) Forget about it. How was your day? It was busy, long, Sirius said carefully, obviously not wanting to provoke Remus any further. The usual stuff, you know. I don't know, Remus muttered. You get to hang around with auras all day. The best I get is Wormtail. Don't be like that, Sirius sat beside Remus on the couch. You're doing plenty of useful stuff still, and they sent you on that mission at the beginning of summer. That was huge. Remus didn't say anything. He hadn't told Sirius what had happened, how he'd lost control yet again, and how Mooney clearly didn't trust him any more, and Danny probably hated him. In the pause that followed, Sirius tutted. Look, if you're in a mood, I'd rather just get out of your way. I haven't had a brilliant day either. Fine, Remus said sharply. It wasn't fine. A part of him wanted to grab Sirius for a kiss, pull him into the bedroom, and apologise for being a dick. The other part wanted a full-blown fight with lots of shouting and swearing. Either way, he didn't want Sirius going anywhere. Sirius sighed and got up. Fine then. He grabbed his keys on the way out. Going to work on the bike, he said. I'll get bread on the way back, seeing as we've run out. Again. Remus grunted in response, staring at the hole in his sock, rather than meet Sirius's eye. They'd make it all up later. They always did. The problem with not being at Hogwarts was that Remus never had any idea where anyone was. He missed the Marauder's map sorely, and felt anxious when he pictured Sirius, James and Peter out in the world, facing who knew what. It typified the way he felt about almost everything now that school was over. At Hogwarts... He'd been in control. He'd had a place, a certain status. In the real world, he was nothing and nobody, 
back to the bottom of the deck. As a mature and educated young man, he knew that he ought to face these new challenges with fortitude and set out to prove his worth, like James and Sirius, and even Pete. But Remus didn't. He sulked. After the cancelled mission with Peter, there had been another long and confusing meeting with the Order, and barely anyone had glanced in Remus's direction. Moody hadn't been there, nor Ferox, so Remus couldn't even go up and ask whether there had been any developments on the greyback front. It was nice to see the girls. Lily was apprenticing in the potion research department at St Mungo's, and she and Marlene had made a whole gang of new friends at the hospital. Mary was at Muggle Secretarial College, and, like Remus, had been unimpressed with her assignments from the order so far. Oh, I suppose they don't want my mucky blood blowing anyone's cover. She rolled her eyes. He sniggered. Good old Mary. Since that meeting, Remus had spent much of his time alone. He slept in, listened to the radio, went downstairs to the corner shop to buy fags, and pretended to read. He told Sirius he was researching defensive magic, but he couldn't see the point in studying for no reason. Remus was sprawled on the couch one day doing the crosswords in a free paper he'd picked up somewhere. Well, he wasn't so much doing the crosswords as trying to write the most imaginative swear words he could think of into the boxes. He was stuck on twelve down, an E and then an F, when the phone rang. It made him jump. The phone never rang. H- hello he said croakily, realising that it was after one o'clock in the afternoon and the first time he'd spoken. Watch your sweetheart. Grant? Someone else calling you sweetheart, you slag. Remus laughed, grinning ear to ear. Snarky tosser. Where have you been? Here and there. Sorry, I've had a bit of a busy summer. Uh, you're at home then? Yeah. Brilliant, I'm five minutes away. What? See you soon. The line went dead. Not knowing what else to do, and mildly stunned, Remus went to the bathroom quickly to check himself in the mirror. He was wearing a creased t-shirt and threw on a jumper lying on the floor to cover up his scarred forearms. His hair never seemed to change, no matter what he did, so he ran his fingers through the curls and watched them spring back into place. He wished he'd showered when he woke up that morning but it was too late now. There was a knock at the door, and Remus hurried to answer it, pointing his wand at the kettle as he passed the kitchen door to flick it on. His pulse quickened, and he realised how excited he was to see someone not involved in the war. He wrenched the door open harder than he needed to, so that it nearly slammed into the wall. Hiya! Grant stood in the doorway, wide-eyed but grinning, his face as round and sunny as it had been at fifteen chipped tooth and bright clothes and everything else that was right in the world. Hi, Remus breathed, standing back to allow Grant entry. I'm so happy to see you. Blimey, Grant nudged him with his trainer as he came inside. If I'd have known I got this sort of welcome, I'd have showed up weeks ago. He stood in the middle of the living room, hands on his hips, staring around in awe. He let out a low whistle. Whew! Done all right for yourself, yeah? Yeah? Very nice. Yeah, I suppose. Remus rubbed the back of his head. It was a bit messy, old newspapers and half-empty mugs of tea all over the place, not to mention the overflowing ashtrays. Suddenly he was very embarrassed. <laughs> what you got a fireplace for? Grant chuckled. Thought these modern flats all had central eating. Mmm. Remus mumbled. Cup of tea? Champion. Remus went into the kitchen and used a bit of wordless magic to hurry it all along, before bringing the mugs through to the living room, where Grant stood inspecting the bookcase. He looked so well. His clothes were clean and smart. He was even wearing a dress shirt, which had a wide floral collar and cuffs. Remus gave him his tea and did a bit of quick tidying before sitting down. I can't believe you're here he said. Grant laughed. <laughs> Me neither, to be honest. Been a long time, yeah? How was your holiday? Oh, um... Grant appeared to be blushing. His ears turned cherry red. 
That was a bit of a fib. I, I, I just didn't want to jinx anything. Jinx what? What have you been doing? I, um... Oh, look, don't laugh at me, all right? I've been doing evening classes. You know, get me O-levels. He looked down. That's brilliant, Rimmer said. Grant looked up at him cautiously, as if waiting for the punchline. Better late than never, I suppose. I had my CSE maths exam today, over in Russell Square. Bloody difficult, but I reckon I did enough to pass. Fucking Pythagoras was a right tosser, yeah? Remus laughed. Well, well done, though. What brought that on? I want to work somewhere other than the pub one day. Grant shrugged. Shagging all them students opened my eyes a bit. Don't want to be a thicko all my life. You're not thick, Remus said firmly, giving him a stern look. Eh, well, we'll see. Grant waved a hand shy again. If I get my maths and my English sorted, and I reckon I did okay on English too, you ought to see my spelling. It's miles better. Then I'm hoping I can start A-levels in January. I want to do psychology, I think. Psychology? Remus said in awe. Yeah, Grant chuckled. Ricky, that's one of the students I was seeing, he reckoned I'd better do politics. But to be honest, I've had it up to here with Trotsky. He was a communist. Trotsky? Ricky? Oh, right. Rima sipped his tea thoughtfully. Everyone was doing things, everyone had a direction, and here he was, just sitting by and watching, as per usual. Self-hatred rose inside of him. Uh, so, how's Sirius? Grunt asked politely. Yeah, good. He's out just now, um, uni lecture. Nice. And your mum? How's she? Dying, Remus grunted. Eh, uh, bummer. Remus practically spat out his tea laughing. Grant grinned. Oi, did you hear about St. Eddie's? What about it? Remus frowned. Shut down. Last approved school in Britain. Apparently, they're all community homes now. What happened to all the boys? Ah, uh, some of them got sent to Brawlstall. The rest got rehoused. They're knocking it down, putting up flats instead. Hmm, good riddance, Remus said darkly. Yeah, I'll drink to that, Grant snorted, raising his mug of tea. They chatted for a bit longer, reminiscing. Grant wasn't seeing anyone serious, and didn't know how much longer he'd be in Brighton. He missed London, but he knew he needed to save up more money if he wanted to move back and make a proper go of it. He was so different from the last time Remus had seen him. Ah, uh, enough about me. What about you? You at uni too? Um, I'm not really doing anything, Remus sighed. It's, it's hard to get a job right now. I've mostly just been here. Lucky you've got this set up, yeah? Grant gestured around, picking up the cigarette box on the coffee table and shaking it. Remus nodded and took one himself too. Yeah, lucky, he said glumly as he lit it. You need to get out more, sweetheart, Grant said, sounding serious. What? Grant tutted, blowing smoke and looking Remus up and down. Look at you, you miserable git. I'm not blind, you know. Cooped up in here, feeling sorry for yourself, is it? No, I... Remus. Grant sighed, shaking his head. Not being horrible, I'm just saying. Remember when I left St Edmunds and I just lived in that squat? Yeah. Remus wished he could forget that, but it was burnt in his memory. The dirty mattresses, the bare floorboards, the damp. I thought it was great at first. No more school, no more matron telling me what to do. Just me looking out for myself. He shook his head, pursing his lips. I liked running away. Done it all the time when I was a kid. Run away from my mum, from my granddad, the prick. From anywhere people tried to keep me in. And the thing is, they always let me. Matron never called the police. Mum never tried to find me. Actually, you were the only person who ever tried to track me down. I... Remus hadn't known that. I don't know how you did it, Grant chuckled, scratching his chin. <laughs> Maybe you got a magic wand or something. But 
You found me. Twice. I thought about it a lot over the past year. I, I just wanted to make sure you were okay. I know you did. Grant smiled softly. That's what amazed me. Here's this lad, this clever, funny, posho lad, who gives a shit about me when no one else ever did. Made me feel something worthwhile. So, thought I'd better do something worthwhile. Remus didn't know what to say. He put his tea down. That's why I wanted to wait till my exams were done before I saw you, Grant continued. Even if I failed a lot, I wanted to tell you I'd done it. I- I'm trying to be better. You never needed to prove anything to me, Remus said earnestly. I know, Grant nodded. I did it for me, really. I did it because running away and avoiding all the stuff that made me feel like shit was pointless in the end. If you want people to think you're worth it, you've got to start acting like you want it. Remus laughed, humorlessly. Sounds like you're already taking psychology. Been reading lots, Grant winked. You get what I'm telling you then. Yeah. Remus sighed. Do something worthwhile, stop moping. Good, Grant said brightly. Because if you're not happy here, I'll switch with you. Nice flat, lots of books, gorgeous boyfriend. Remus laughed again and kicked Grant's shin playfully. Shut up. Never. Anyway, best be off. I've got a train to catch. I'll be popping back in a month or so, as long as I get the results I need. You will, Remus said confidently. I know you will. Cheers. Give me a ring soon, yeah? They hugged at the door and Remus watched him go, hopping down the stairs two at a time, whistling a pop tune. Remus felt lighter, his cheeks ached from smiling. He closed the door and looked at the messy room. He felt like doing the washing up. Then he might nip to the shops and get something for dinner. Sirius had been out all day. He'd like coming home to a proper meal. Tomorrow, Remus could make a proper start on everything else. There was so much to do. Chapter 155 the war, winter, nineteen seventy-eight to nineteen seventy-nine. Rose and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air and feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that wave, but now they only block the sun. Snow on everyone So many things I would have done But clouds got in my way I've looked at clouds from both sides now Come up and down And still some cloudy cloud illusion Saturday, the 23rd of December, 1978. Jesus Christ, Remus grumbled, opening his sticky eyes. He fumbled on the bedside for his glass of water and found it empty. Aquamenti, he rasped, his wand hand shaking. The glass filled with water and he gulped it down greedily. He rolled onto his back, pressing the heels of his hands into his eyes, hoping to mitigate the headache threatening to start gnawing on his brain. He turned his head slightly and addressed the lump under the duvet. You awake? There was a sort of a shudder and a grunt. Remus tutted. It was too hot in the bedroom, even for December. He got up and went to the window to crack it open. He pressed his forehead against the cold glass and let the cold air wash over his hot skin. They'd been out at the leaky cauldron the night before, pre-Christmas drinks. The marauders and Lily would be spending Christmas itself at the Potters, but everyone who was working had finished for the year, and Mary had suggested blowing off some steam away from the older members of the Order of the Phoenix for once. As with most of Mary's ideas, it was brilliant fun. Marlene came and brought Yaz, who was visiting the McKinnons because her family didn't do Christmas anyway. Frank and Alice popped by to say hello, and Cyrus and James insisted on getting in every other round. After last orders, 
those still standing had piled into a taxi back to Remus and Sirius's flat, where they might not have had any milk or bread in, but the bar was always fully stocked. Everything had been a bit of a blur after that. Remus had a horrible feeling that he and Lily had started singing muggle Christmas carols at some point. He groaned loudly. Oh, why did you let me drink so much? Oi, don't blame me. Lily suddenly appeared, her fluffy red hair sticking up like a dandelion as she emerged from under the duvet. Remus jumped, whirling around. He wrapped his arms protectively around himself. Fucking hell, Evans, what are you doing here? I couldn't get James to leave, she yawned. And I wasn't going to sleep on the couch. They started building a fort. This is the second time you showed up in the bedroom unannounced, Evans. People will talk. Remus searched for a t-shirt. The <laughs> second time I've caught you in your pants, too, she laughed. Oh, get back in, you big Jesse, it's still early. He did, but only because the room was cold now, and he didn't fancy finding out what James and Sirius had done to the living room. T-shirt on, he crawled back under the duvet, and Lily wrapped her arms around his waist, her long hair tickling under his chin, like Sirius's did. He stroked her shoulder. She was so nice and small. Do you reckon if I'd agreed to go out with you in fourth year, this is what our life would be like? He asked, conversationally. Oh, God, she groaned, covering her eyes with her fingers. Do you have to remind me? He laughed. I don't know why you're embarrassed. I was the oblivious one. I had such a crush on you. Shh, he chuckled. James took two weeks to forgive me. I had to swear under truth serum that I had no nefarious intentions towards you. Oh, that idiot. I love him. Hmm. I'm so glad it's Christmas, she sighed. We all need a break, don't we? Yeah. I'm supposed to be packing today, then at James's parents this evening. Will you be there? Sirius might, Remus said. I'm visiting my mother. You know she's, um, she's in the hospice now. Oh, of course. Lily gave him a squeeze. Sorry, love. How is she? I don't think they expected her to make it all the way to Christmas, but she's hanging on. <sighs> oh, Remus. Lily sighed sadly. It's fine. Remus pulled away, deciding he might as well get up after all. Right. I need a cup of tea and a ciggy, he said, getting out of bed and pulling his jeans on. Ugh, you two really need to give up smoking, Lily said, sitting up. This sheet stinks. Hmm, don't tell me you've never had a cheeky post-coil to fag, Evans. Remus winked, heading for the door. post Oh, my God, Remus! He was still smirking to himself when he entered the living room, which looked like a bomb had hit it. The sofa had been moved into the middle of the room for some reason, and the cushions were moved. James was fast asleep, sprawled across what looked like a giant cream mattress on the floor. Sirius was curled up at James's feet, with one of Remus's jumpers rolled up under his head. Remus edged into the kitchen, flicking the kettle on. Every surface was sticky with something sweet and alcoholic. There were mugs and glasses sitting about, half full, some with half-smoked cigarettes floating in them. Remus grimaced and felt his stomach contract, so he opened a window for air. He really didn't want to be sick if he could help it. Mary had written, Merry Christmas, blood traitors, on the fridge door in a cheerful pink lipstick, with three big X kisses below. She was spending the rest of her Christmas in Jamaica, the first time she had ever visited her grandparents' home country. Remus was glad of it. Christmas had never been a good time as far as the war was concerned and having Mary as far away from danger as possible made him feel a bit better. He wasn't thrilled about doing Christmas at the Potters, though he felt guilty about even thinking that. Sirius would never consider spending the holidays anywhere else, so of course Remus would go along with it. And it wasn't anything to do with Mr and Mrs Potter, who had been better to him than any real family he'd had. It was the war and the order, and bloody Moody, who was sure to be there too. Is that the kettle? Sirius wailed from the living room. Yep, Remus called back. Two ticks. 
You're a hero amongst men, Mooney, James said when Remus arrived in the living room with a tray of milky cups of tea. Oh, I know. Remus nodded, sipping from his cup. He perched on the arm of the sofa. What the fuck have you done to my furniture? It's brilliant, isn't it? Sirius grinned up at him, cross-legged on the gigantic sofa cushion. Prongs's idea. We did an engorgement charm. Shall we help you do clean up? Lily said, padding through from the bedroom. She picked up a cup of tea and sat down next to James, leaning into his shoulder sleepily. Breakfast first, Rima said quickly. Fry up. Fry up, they all agreed in unison. They went to the nearest greasy spoon cafe and ordered full Englishes all round, after which everyone felt much better prepared to face the day. After breakfast, Sirius, Lily and James started work on tidying the flat, while Remus, at Sirius's insistence, got himself ready to visit Hope. He didn't wear a suit, that would have been overkill, even at Christmas, but he made an effort, ironing his cleanest Grandel shirt and putting on a brown corduroy jacket he'd picked up at Portobello Market. He even polished his shoes. Sirius had offered to come with him, but Remus preferred to go alone. It was easiest if he had time to process his interactions with Hope in private, which he hoped Cyrus understood. Anyway, no one wanted to be stuck back sitting in a building full of dying people two days before Christmas. The hospice itself was the other side of Cardiff. It didn't feel much different from the hospital, except that the rooms were private and furnished with a bit more care. She had fresh flowers every day now, which was nice. Remus brought a poinsettia, because Lily had told him that they were Christmassy, and Hope was no longer eating solid food, so chocolates were out. Someone had wound gold and silver tinsel around her bed frame, and blue tacked Christmas cards to the wall. There were so many it looked as though she had a special festive wallpaper. She said that if you came while she was sleeping, I was to wake her up straight away, said the cheerful nurse on duty. Oh, thanks. I'll I'll wake her, he smiled. His mother lay dozing softly in her big hospital bed. He wondered how tall she was standing up. Quite small, he imagined, based on the pictures he had of her with Lyle, and how tiny her hands were. He had only ever seen her lying down, and now he realised he might never see her any other way. He touched her hand gently, squeezing it with his fingers. Her eyes fluttered, and she frowned the pain evident on her face. She turned her head and saw him, and her brow smoothed at once. Hello, my darling, she said thickly, as if her mouth was full of cotton wool. Merry Christmas, Mum, he said, sitting down. Natalie Glawen, she said, in neat, earthy Welsh. How are you? Better for seeing you, she smiled. I'm so glad you've come. Of course, he said earnestly. It's Christmas. There had been no talk of his visits to her on Christmas Day itself. They'd both skirted around the issue, and Remus assumed that she wanted to spend it with her real family. She asked now, though. Where will you be? At home with Sirius? It was strange to hear her say his name, with her soft rolling R's. At our friend's parents, he replied. The Potter's. You met Mrs. Potter once, she told me. Euphemia. I won't remember, she shook her head. I'd invite you here, but it won't be much fun for you, I'm afraid. Whatever you like, Mum, he said, hoping he didn't sound disappointed. You'll be happier with your friends, she said, as if to herself. Mr. Potter knew Lyle. Remus prodded a bit harder, wanting to talk about something more substantial. They worked at the ministry together, and they went to the pub sometimes, and James, their son, he was born in March, same as me. I don't remember, Hope said, more forcefully this time. I'm sorry, Remus, I don't. Lyle kept those things separate. It's often better that way, you'll learn. He thought about this thought about how little he'd known about his parents for most of his life, and how little he'd known about himself as a result. 
He thought about Sirius and how they always fought because Remus wasn't open enough. How much it hurt other people to keep secrets, even when you were trying to protect them. I don't agree, he said simply. I don't think it's good to hide things all the time. Well, Hope said. She looked away and withdrew her hand from his. Remus realised that she was annoyed with him. It was an odd sensation and a first for their relationship. He wasn't sure how to react. If he'd known her all his life, then he would know what to do. It would be old hat bickering with your mum. His temper rose the more he thought about it. This was her fault. His stupid stunted emotions. His complete inability to be comfortable with other people. And here she was, avoiding him. He wanted her attention, and he only knew one way to get it. Mrs Potter, James's mum, she's great, he said. She makes the best mince pies ever, and a full Christmas dinner, and she always gets me a present, even though I'm not a kid. Hope pursed her lips, but still didn't look up. That sounds nice, she said in a small, tight voice. Remus ploughed on. Yeah, James is really lucky. I'd never even had a proper Christmas until I went to the Potters. Yes, you did. She looked up at him suddenly, and he saw his own anger reflected back in her eyes. You did, she said. We had lovely Christmases when you were little. She was staring at him as if he was mad, as if he was the one who was ill, not her. Don't you remember the tree with the gold angel and the nativity set? I thought you'd swallowed baby Jesus one year, but you had him under your pillow because I'd told you about nasty old King Herod and you wanted to keep him safe. You were so sweet. And we brought you that hobby horse and the farm set. You loved the farm set and the little pink piglets. I was forever finding them in the garden. And the hand puppets. And the army tank. Remember your tank? I told Lyle you were too young. You were a sensitive boy. I didn't like you playing wars, but you loved it. And Daddy used to make it move with his magic. And you'd chatter away together for hours. She trailed off, clearly upset. Remus gawped at her. I don't, I don't remember any of that, Mum, he said. He searched for her hand again and squeezed it. I wish I did, though. It sounds nice. I think about you every year, she said tearfully, voice shaking. Every night, I used to light the advent candle and think about you, Remus. And I'd talk about you. I'd tell the cyan about you. He snapped to attention. She was watching him warily, as though afraid he might lash out. Aware of this, he kept his voice even. Could you tell me a bit about cyan? Hope gnawed her lip. She looked so exhausted from the pain and the drugs and the fucking cancer. He was starting to feel guilty, but they were almost out of time. She's eight, she said finally. She'll be nine in February. And she's your daughter with... with Gethin? Remus asked, feeling as though all of the air had left the room. Hope nodded, closing her eyes. Tears spilt out under her lashes, streaming down her cheeks. I never remarried. Not after Lyle. But I fell in love. I had my cyan. Only cyan? She nodded again. Remus frowned. When I first came to see you, the nurse said you were always talking about your kids. Uh, I, I thought you had more than one. I do. She looked at him puzzled, blinking through tears. You and cyan? Oh, He felt dreadful. All this time, he'd thought he was one of Hope's terrible secrets. I've never been ashamed, she said, a note of defiance entering her voice. Not of my lovely boy. Never. Mum. He felt as though he'd been punched in the gut. He was crying too, all of a sudden, and he squeezed her hand desperately. Come here. She reached out for him and he got up to sit carefully on the edge of the bed, leaning over so that she could wrap her arms around him. He rested his head on her shoulder, trying not to put too much weight on her frail body, but she was stronger than he gave her credit for, and held him tightly. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Mum, he said, his words muffled by her soft nightgown. She smelt of talcum powder and lavender and family. She stroked his hair. You've nothing to be sorry for, sweetheart. I love you. <laughs> I love you too, he wept. He stayed at the hospice for longer than usual, and by the time he had apparated to the potter's front gate, he was exhausted. He felt like laundry that had been wrung out and splayed on a cloth line, weak and bare and empty. James had to question him at the door. It was second nature now. Which film did we see in, in summer of 1974? The Great Gatsby, he replied grimly. James saw the look on his face and stepped aside at once. All right, Mooney, he asked, putting a hand on Remus's shoulder. Yeah, Remus nodded, hoping he just looked tired. I, I don't want to be rude, but would it be all right if I just went to bed? Um, tell your parents I'm really sorry. I'm just... Yeah, of course, mate, James said eagerly. You go up. I'll tell him you're knackered. Thank you, Remus smiled. He climbed the familiar stairs to bed. He really hoped Mrs. Potter wouldn't mind. He'd be fine in the morning. But just now, he wasn't sure if his nerves could handle seeing her. She always hugged him, too, and being hugged by one mother today was about as much as he could take. Of course, it wasn't long before Sirius poked his head around the bedroom door. "'I'll leave you be, if you want,' he said, carrying in a tray loaded with cheese, pickle, ham, crackers, and, of course, Mrs. Potter's famous mince pies. I just thought you might be peckish. I'm starving. Remus grinned at him. Thank you. Looking very pleased with himself, Sirius crossed the room more confidently and set the tray down on the bed between them. They sat quietly for a while, cross-legged on the duvet, Remus eating, Sirius pretending not to watch him. When he was finished, Sirius took the tray away and Remus lay down, stretching out his aching limbs. Shall I go? Sirius asked. No, Remus said. Just don't expect too much, okay? Okay. He lay down next to Remus on his back. How's the hangover? Remus asked, remembering the state they'd all been in that morning. <laughs> Fine, Sirius snorted. Evans and her potions. Great. Remus closed his eyes, letting the events of the day settle in his mind. It was good to have Sirius there, he decided. Being alone might be really awful. If only there was a way he could express that without having it come out wrong. I've got a sister, he said finally. She's eight. Wow. Hmm. He reached for Sirius's hand and held it. It took her months to tell me. God knows what else I don't know. I wish we had more time together. Sirius squeezed his hand sympathetically. Remus licked his lips, steeling himself for the next bit. I wish we had more time, but I also... I also wish she would be more open. It really hurts, knowing that there are parts of her that she keeps private. Oh? Sirius was doing an excellent job of keeping his cool. If Remus hadn't been so sad, it would be comical. Yeah, he said. He turned to look at Sirius. Sirius turned to look back at him. I'm so sorry, Remus said nervously. If I ever make you feel that way. Mooney, it's just that I get worried, Remus said quickly. That you won't, if you knew some things. There's nothing you could tell me that would change how I feel, Sirius said. 
Remus was speechless at that. But it was a good feeling, a happy feeling, even considering the circumstances. He couldn't look at Sirius any more, so he rolled onto his side. Luckily, Sirius seemed to understand and followed suit, draping an arm across Remus's body. Remus breathed in slowly. That mission I did, back in the summer, it went really badly, he said, feeling the weight already lifting. I thought something had happened, Sirius said. Go on. I... Do you remember how I got, the last time, that there were werewolves nearby? Like, really pushy, and sort of not thinking. That happened again. No one got hurt, but I'm pretty sure Danny thinks I'm dangerously mad now. It didn't happen to him. I think he must have felt it. But we reacted differently. I sort of took charge. Not on purpose, just felt natural at the time. That makes sense, Sirius said. That's what you do on full moons. We have to let you be the leader. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it like that. So, if no one got hurt, what happened? One of the werewolves tried to attack me, but I overpowered him, Rima said. I was supposed to get information, but all I did was rile them up. What did Moody say about it? He was cryptic. I don't think he was angry. He asked me if I minded going alone next time, without Danny. But he hasn't sent me on any other missions. Not proper ones. It's been months. They have to be saving you for something, Sirius said. I know they have to be. James keeps telling Frank and Alice how good you are at defensive magic. And they they just say that they can't do anything without an order from someone above them. (sighs) Maybe, Remus sighed. Did he really say you had to go alone next time? He didn't say I had to. Just asked if I minded. And I don't think there's any other way. Danny won't work with me again. He was too scared. So, I suppose... Yeah... It'll just be me next time. Sirius's arms tightened around Remus. I hate that. Remus didn't have a response, and Sirius didn't seem to be looking for one, so they just lay like that quietly for a while, until Remus fell asleep. Boxing Day, 1978 As Lily had predicted, Christmas Day, 1978, was a welcome break from everyone's troubles. In fact... Perhaps because it had been a particularly difficult year, Remus always remembered that Christmas as one of the most pleasant and happy they had together. Mr and Mrs Potter were slowing down a bit. Euphemia said she wasn't up to hosting a big party as she usually did. And anyway, the Ministry had warned against large social gatherings. Mr Potter had to be locked out of his study. James and Sirius stole the key. But he saw the funny side and joined in with the festivities wholeheartedly. Remus noticed that this year it was really James and Lily who were the hosts. She coordinated most of the cooking, the decorating, the card writing, while he made sure that everyone always had a drink, that all of the usual Christmas games were played, and that the house was full of joy at all times. As for presents, it was all of the usual fare. Sweets and nuts and candied fruit, new socks and underwear, a pair of pyjamas from Lily as a joke. So I can stop catching you in your knickers! and a shiny new pair of Doc Martens from Sirius. Surprisingly, Remus also got a gift from Grant, and felt guilty for not getting him one in return. He laughed when he opened it, a Philofax organiser. Grant had written his own address and phone number in the first page, and in the back there were notes, and he had written, New Year's Resolution, Number 1, Stop and Smell the Roses. Christmas Day was over and done with, James and Lily were heading to the Evanses for Boxing Day. James was absolutely dreading it, having met Lily's sister twice already, and failed to impress her either time. So Sirius and Remus went back to their own home to settle in and get ready for the new year. Sirius rather liked the idea of hosting his own party, and Remus was prepared to give in, as long as they only invited people they knew. How many do you reckon we can fit in this flat anyway? Remus asked as they opened the door. 
It's not like we've got a ballroom. There's only one sofa. We ought to knock through the kitchen. Have it all open plan. Cyrus replied as they walked in. The phone was ringing and he went to answer it. Hello? He frowned and then he held out the phone to Remus. For you, I think. Remus took the receiver from him. Well, of course it was for him. Sirius didn't know anyone who could use a phone. Hello? Hello? Is that Remus Lupin? It was a man, with a deep voice and a broad Welsh accent. Remus's insides went cold, and he sat down on the arm of the couch, steadying himself. Yeah, th- that's right. Ah, good. Uh, my name's Gethin Rees. Remus swallowed and found his throat dry. Is she... She's gone, isn't she? There was a long quiet on the other side of the phone, and Remus began to cry. Finally, Gethin spoke, his own voice sounding very rough. Sorry, lad. Funeral's next Wednesday. Wednesday, the 3rd of January, 1979. Remus sighed, staring out of their bedroom window, watching the raindrops sliding down the glass. When he was a little boy and it rained, he would sit on the biggest window sill he could find at St Edmund's and pick two droplets, then pretend they were racing to the bottom of the pane. An idea he'd got from a poem. Maybe one Hope had read to him, which he'd forgotten now. It always rained at funerals in films, That was called Pathetic Fallacy. Remus had read about it in an old A-level English textbook. Of course, if you had a funeral in Wales in January, the chances of rain were extremely high too. It was a strange thing to be glad about, but it seemed proper. A sunny day would have been intolerable. Ready? Sirius asked, very gently entering the room. Remus looked up at him, feeling numb, and nodded. Sirius looked gorgeous in a black suit, his hair tied back. Remus felt scruffy. Though they were dressed identically, Sirius just wore clothes better. Remus had wanted to cut his hair short to make it look tidier, but he'd been convinced not to in the end. Still, the urge to do something drastic was there. Take your time, Sirius said. We've got an hour or so. Remus nodded again. The service was supposed to start at eleven, but Gethin had said that if he wanted to come earlier and meet the mourners, then he was welcome to. Remus still wasn't sure. Sirius closed the bedroom door and came to sit down next to him. He held his hand and stared out of the window too. Have you ever been to a funeral before? Remus asked finally. Uncle Alfred's, Sirius replied. I was little, I don't remember much. I've never... I've never lost anyone close. Hmm. Remus inclined his head, still watching the raindrops against the grey sky. I don't know if I knew Hope all that well. I didn't even know her for a whole year. I don't think that matters. Nor do I. Remus bowed his head. He wasn't going to cry again. He didn't think he could... He had felt good the first time, a big rush of emotion. But since then, nothing. Just a blankness, an empty feeling he hadn't had before. Sirius gripped his hand again. I'll be with you the whole time. Remus looked at him and smiled weakly. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm ready. He stood up, finally whirring into action. Oh shit, he said, slapping his forehead. The flowers! Padfoot! I forgot to pick up the bloody flowers! Sirius put a hand on his shoulder. I got Wormtail to do it. He's got them. 
and Lily's got the address for the church so we don't get lost. Prongs has the food for the wake. His mum sent along some pork pies and sausage rolls, and I've got the umbrellas sorted. All you need to do is apparate. Everything else is taken care of, right? Overwhelmed, Remus grabbed him and hugged him tightly. Thank you, he said. Sirius hugged him back. Anything for our Mooney, yeah? Remus smiled, breathing in Sirius's hair, his scent, letting it anchor him. The words popped into his head almost out of nowhere, and finally, finally it was easy to say. Sirius, he whispered, still holding on. Yeah? I love you. Sirius kissed his cheek, huffing a soft laugh, which sounded like relief. I love you too. They walked into the living room hand in hand. James and Peter were also in suits, and Lily in a simple black dress, her usually vibrant hair neatly tied back in a bun. She was carrying an enormous bouquet of flowers. They all gave Remus cautious, sympathetic smiles, which he was getting used to now. He nodded back at them all, gratefully. Right, Sirius said, taking charge. Let's do this. It was a small village church, just outside of Hope's hometown. It was where she had been christened, and if she had married a muggle, it was where the wedding would have been. Remus knew from their brief conversations that Hope had not been particularly religious, but that her family belonged to the church in Wales, so she went along for tradition's sake. It was a very pretty building, or at least it would have been, if it wasn't raining so hard. Soft grey granite, the bell tower and a pointed steeple, simple but pretty stained glass windows, like a church in a picture book. The graveyard was full of ancient tombstones and stone crosses, but Hope would be cremated, as per her wishes. The marauders and Lily approached slowly, walking up the sodden pathway to join the cluster of mourners gathered in the doorway. Rumor spotted Gethin straight away, standing just inside the porch, shaking hands with each attendee as they entered. He was a tall man, like Lyle, but not as spindly. He had dark hair, thick black eyebrows, and rather a weak chin. He looked completely broken, and Remus was instantly less nervous about meeting him. Lily, James and Peter hung back, looking for somewhere to put all of the food they'd brought in for the wake, which was supposed to be in the church hall around the back. Remus and Sirius silently waited their turn to go in. "'Hello,' Gethin said, barely looking up as Remus approached. "'Thank you for coming.' Um, I'm Remus,' Remus said, shaking the offered hand. Gethin looked up at once, blinking. They were about eye level. "'Remus,' Gethin shook his hand weakly, his dark eyes raking over Remus. "'Hope talked about you all the time. "'It's a shame we're meeting like this.' "'Yeah,' Remus nodded. "'They stood awkwardly for a while, just looking at each other, "'before Gethin came to his senses. "'Go in,' he said, gesturing. "'Your mum was keen on you sitting in the front row, "'but it's up to you.' "'Thanks,' Remus nodded again. "'See you after, yeah?' "'Gethin patted his shoulder.' Yeah, good, Remus said, aware that he was speaking in single syllables. In the end, Sirius had to nudge him into the church, as he seemed to have forgotten how to move. They made their way slowly to the front and sat down. Remus could hear people whispering about him. A few of them knew who he was, and the reaction was mixed. He ignored it. He was there for hope and no one else. The service itself was a blur, and he barely listened. He just stared at the eagle-shaped lectern and tried to conjure up a decent memory of his mother. They didn't sing a hymn. They played a Johnny Mitchell song instead. Hope had never mentioned Johnny Mitchell to Remus, but he supposed it must have meant something to her. That was a painful thought. They'd had so little time, it wasn't fair. Cyan was there, of course. Remus recognised her at once. She was the only child present. She was dressed in a cream-coloured frock with a black satin sash and kept her head buried in the lap of an old woman that Remus didn't know. He assumed that was Gethin's mother, Cyan's grandmother. She cried all the way through and for some reason that was comforting to Remus. 
Hope must have been a wonderful mother. Afterwards, Remus's legs felt like lead. He was rooted to the spot. He didn't get up with the rest of the family to walk out. There was no coffin to follow. Her body was already in the crematorium, apparently, but waited behind for the church to clear. Sirius waited with him. When the church was all but empty, Sirius whispered, You okay? Remus nodded. Sirius touched his knee lightly, but no more than that. That was really sad. It's okay if you're tired and want to go home. No, it's fine. Remus shook his head. I ought to go. I told Gethina would. Just five more minutes. They had to leave eventually. The caretaker wanted to tidy up. The church hall was very small and crammed full of people and people's emotions. Some of them were laughing, reminiscing. Others were still red-nosed and sombre. It was a drab little room, which needed refurbishing. The wooden floorboards were splintering in places, and there were notice boards dedicated to drawings by the children who attended Sunday school there, and another one for the local scout troop. Three trestle tables were groaning under the weight of the food people had brought. Piles of sandwiches, meat pies, crisps, cheese and pineapple skewers, fruit cake, leftover turkey curry, slices of ham and other cold cuts. It was a dry funeral, and an old lady in the corner was serving wheat cups of milky tea. For once in his life, Remus was not hungry. Worst of all, there was a table covered in framed photographs and albums. Most of them were of hope, and apart from one or two snaps of her as a little girl, none of them had been taken before 1965. Remus looked at them all, tried to fix the image in his mind, a happy, healthy woman who had always tried to do what was best, even when other people let her down. She'd be so glad you came. Gethin appeared beside him. He reached out and stroked the glass on one of the photo frames. Hope's black and white face beamed out at him, static and lifeless. I had to, Remus said quietly. Cyrus stood at his other shoulder, ready for anything. Remus looked at Gethin. I wish I'd been there for... Well, to say goodbye. It was very quiet, like she was, the older man said. She was awake on Christmas morning, and went to sleep after lunch. There was no pain. Remus hadn't thought about her being in pain. He wished Gethin hadn't put that in his head. I know what you're thinking, Gethin said, nodding at the photo display. No pictures of you. It wasn't deliberate. She put them all in a box for me to send to you, only I've lost track of your address. I don't want them. Remus shook his head. Remus, Sirius said softly. Don't make any decisions yet. Remus just shrugged. There are a few other bits, Gethin said, eyeing Sirius with some confusion and some curiosity, then looking at Remus again. I'll hang on to them as long as you like. Bits? Remus looked at him blankly. Things she wanted you to have, Gethin said. Not money or anything. I'm not interested in money, Remus said sharply. Gethin frowned. He looked hurt. His eyes were rimmed red, with dark rings under them, like smudges of coal dust. Remus pursed his lips and took a step back, shaking his head. I'm sorry, I can't be here, I'm sorry. And with that, turned and walked straight out of the hall. It had stopped raining by now, but the grass was still wet and there was the delicious scent of earth rising all around. There was a group of old men sitting on some benches outside. They had loosened their ties and sat slouched, smoking and passing around an illicit flask of something that smelled very strong. Remus tutted, disgusted, and kept walking, wanting to get away from everything. Remus! Cyrus came jogging up the path to catch him. Lily, James and Peter not far behind. I want to go, Remus said. You can come back to Mum and Dad's if you want, James suggested. Mum said she'll do us all dinner. No. Remus shook his head. He grabbed Sirius's arm and looked at him imploringly. Please, can we just go back to the flat? Just you and me. Of course we can. Sirius put his own calm hand over Remus's desperate one, and Remus felt his heart begin to steady. So that was what they did. 
rumours promising himself that he would apologise to the Potters and his friends another time. But if he'd been hoping for a respite from the rest of the world, to lock himself away with Sirius and pretend that, just for a moment, nothing else mattered, then he was in for a disappointment. There was an owl sitting on top of the mantelpiece when they got in, with a note tied to its scaly leg. Remus, my condolences. Please meet me at the Aura's office at 9am on Monday. A. Moody End of chapter 155